to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. And I want to thank Melody. Melody went ahead and sent us a one-time donation through the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Thank you so much for that. You can also send along a one-time donation through support.greatdetectives.net or by mail to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And you can become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters, now uh, more than 200 Patreon supporters, at patreon.greatdetectives.net. And over at uh, greatdetectives.net this weekend, check out my review of The Avengers, the comic strip adaptations, volume 4 as we check out the latest audio adventures of John Steed and Emma Peel. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Dragnet. The original air date on this one is September the 6th, 1955, and the title is The Big Ruling. Ladies and gentlemen, The story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a narcotics detail. You get a report that a supply of heroin has reached your city. You don't know who's got it or where it is. Your job? Find out. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, May 23rd. It was cool in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out on narcotics detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Waller. My name's Friday. We're on our way back from questioning an informant, and it was 10.46 p.m. when we got to the first street station. Narcotics squad room. You think Bronco's holding out on us? I don't know. Well, if we don't turn something pretty soon, the stuff will be all over town. Yeah. How about a cup of coffee, Joe? Huh? Coffee. You want a cup? Sure, if you got some. Yeah, I brought a thermos from home. Oh. Made them myself, the way I like it. You know, strong. Mm-hmm. I got some cups. Wait a minute. You don't need them, Joe. What? Don't need them. I got cups right here on the top of the thermos, four of them. It's some gadget, huh? Look at that. Kids gave it to me for Christmas. Of course, Faye probably picked it out. Mm-hmm. Oh, look at her steam. Really keeps the heat in. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Drink up. Thanks. What's the matter? Something the matter? <clears throat> no, no. No, you were right. That's all. What do you mean? About it being strong. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When I want coffee, I want boil water, buddy. Mm-hmm. Well, this stuff's got some taste to it. It sure has. Well, aren't you going to finish yours? Well, I'm not thirsty right now. Oh. Hey, you know, Joe, I just realized something. Hmm? All these years I've been working with you, it never dawned on me before. What's that? You don't like coffee. Oh, yes, I do. No, you don't, Joe. Not the real genuine articles, stuff they serve in restaurants, drug stores. Or... Heck, that's not coffee. It's not, huh? No, this is coffee. Yeah. A little bite to it, a little zing. Yeah. You don't like it. Well. (laughs) All these years I've been working with a partner who doesn't appreciate good coffee. Well, I guess you learn something all the time. Mm -hmm. Don't finish it if you don't want. Narcotics Friday. Who? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Candy. Mm Mm-hmm. That's right. Are you still at the same place? Sure, I know where it is. What's that room number? Okay. Goodbye. It's Candy Delman. Yeah? You heard we were talking to Bronco tonight. Bronco, tell him what it was about? Must have. 
At least Candy knows we didn't get anywhere. Huh? Says it's our own fault for not going to the right guy. And who's that? Him. Candy Delman was an informant who had served three sentences for violation of the State Narcotics Act. Since his release from prison, he had given police officers several leads to burglary and robbery suspects. Most of his leads had panned out. As far as we knew, Delman was no longer a narcotics user or pusher himself, but in the past, he had always refused to give any information on the dope racket. Over the phone, he said he was living at the Hattrick Hotel on South Spring Street, room 217. Frank and I left the office and drove out to talk to him. It was 11.22 p.m. when we got to the hotel, a dark, two-story building badly in need of repair. We went inside and started up the stairs to the second floor. Get back down here, both of you. Come on, start moving. What's the trouble, lady? Something the matter with your eyesight? No, I don't think so. Why don't you use it? Sign right here on the desk, ring for the manager. Oh. Yeah. Didn't hear no ring, did I? We didn't see any reason to bother you. It's my worry, ain't it? Sure. The bell's there to be rung. And hearing it ain't what bothers me. It's guys like you sneaking in trying to get a free pad for the night. Take it easy, lady. We don't want to stay here any longer than we have to. Then what do you want? We just dropped by to see Candy. Who? Candy Delman. He lives here, doesn't he? He might. Well? A friend of yours? He's expecting a How do I know? Well, why don't you ask him? Oh, sure. That's all I gotta do. Tramp up and down them stairs from morning till night. Call him to the phone. Give him messages. Dun him for back rent. Well, I ain't making no extra trip on account of you. Well, you suit yourself. I just you wait a minute. I ain't said you could go upstairs. Claim to know Candy. What's his room number? 217. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so. Well, you be sure you let me know when you leave. And you better be out of here by midnight or I'm collecting a buck from each of you. Friends or no friends, you're not bunking with Candy unless I get paid. In advance! Oh, she's mild you know. You know something, John? Hmm? Faye was after me just the other day about getting a new suit. Oh? I guess she was right. Yeah. She must be down this way. Yeah. Maybe you ought to go with me. Buy some clothes yourself. What for? Well, we must need them. If a dame like that figures we'd mooch a room in this joint. Well, that wouldn't help with her. Here we are. Yeah, who is it? Joe. Just a minute. Come on in. Thank you. You know Frank Smith, don't you, Candy? Sure. Hi, Candy. Want a drink? No, thanks. Smith? No, thanks. Don't mind if I take a blast? That's up to you. Mm-hmm. As long as I'm drinking alone, there's no point in dirtying the glass. I guess maybe I'm turning into a lush, huh? Is that right? Been hitting the bottle pretty hard lately, since I went off the stuff. Is that so? Yeah. You guys knew I was off it, didn't you? I ain't even chip you no more. Well, you don't have to sell us candy. Well, I ain't selling nobody. I'm just telling you. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you want to see us about? Anybody know you're here? The lady downstairs. You mean the manager of this flea bag? Yeah, I guess that's what she is. <laughs> Lady, you ask me and flying saucers must be real. Well. How else would a dame like that get here? Hey, she knew you cops. We didn't tell her. You telling anybody else that you were coming to see me? Nope. Come on, Candy, what's it all about, huh? Well, take it easy. Don't push me. <laughs> Why don't you sit down? We're all right. You was talking to Bronco tonight, huh? Well? I bumped into him right after you shoved off. That's so? Yeah, asking a mule like him about H, boy, he's lucky if he can turn a couple sticks of tea. We're asking everybody. Didn't ask me? Well, you figured it'd be a waste of time. I've helped you guys before. No, not when it came to the stuff you didn't. Maybe this is different. Yeah. I always figured a guy gets hooked. That's his own business. He done it himself. Mm-hmm. That's his getting hurt, too, yours truly. Mm-hmm. I've been hooked three times. I don't know. Yeah, you should. Guy wants to kick it. It's up to him, too. Mm-hmm. You can stick him in a joint, send him to the hospital. Maybe he'll get rid of the habit for a while. But if he wants to kick it for good, he's got to do it. Mm-hmm. Nobody else. It ain't easy, either. <laughs> Guy's own business is what happens. Whether he goes for a ride or gets off. All right, mm. come on, Candy. What are you getting at here? Horse you're looking for, it ain't just going to guys, boy. You mean kids, too? Yeah. How do you know that? Fella asked me if I wanted to make a buy. I thought I was still shooting caps. What fella? Mm-mm. Come on, we'll stand in front of you, Candy. Well, you take it my way or you don't get it. That means no names. All right, give us the rest of it. 
Well, like I said, he asked me if I was interested in a buy, and I told him I wasn't. No. Yeah. He said that was okay with him. He had plenty of other customers. He cut a lot thinner for some of them. A pro like me, I might know the difference. Mm-hmm. Kids just off of the weed, they wouldn't care. He said he was only making me an offer as a favor, you know. Mm-hmm. Did you ever buy from him before? Well, look, Joe, just let me tell it, huh? Go ahead. Well, <clears throat> the way he talked uh, kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Even when I was pushing, I never sold a kid. You know that. Mm. I ain't no saying. I never pushed no kids. It just didn't seem right. Yeah. So when I bumped into Bronco tonight and he told me that you guys were looking for H, well, I figured maybe I owed you a hand. Go ahead. Make you feel kind of funny. What? I never finked on a guy in a trade before. You know that. Mm-hmm. Well, you're out of it now, aren't you? Yeah, for now. You never know, Joe. Three times, you know, I've been down. You never know when it's going to happen again. I ain't making no promises, even to myself. Mm-hmm. That's why I ain't never copped out on anything like this before. It's sort of like turning myself in. It's good age, too. It's Eastern. Yeah. It's been cut, but it's not too thin. The way you talk, it must have been, oh, six, eight ounces left. The rest of it's been sold. Yeah. He can cut a lot thinner if he wants to. It's dealing with kids. It don't matter, you know. Well, where do we find him, Candy? You ever hear of Walker Drive, Hollywood Hills? We can find it. Well, it's not much of a street. It's just four or five blocks, dead end. Mm. Cuts off a laurel before you get to Mulholland. Well, go ahead. That's it. Well, which house? I didn't say nothing about no house. Maybe he lives there, or maybe he's just going up to make a sale. I don't know. You think he's there now? I didn't ask him for no time schedule. Now, go on, beat it, will you? I want to get drunk. Oh, hey, look, there's something about you guys that keeps me sober. If you don't shove off, I'm going to run out of booze. You want to tell us what he looks like, Candy? You've had it, Joe. Now, I'm going to tell you something you haven't given us very much. Is that so? Well, you know something? It's lucky for you I got principles about pushing the kids. Yeah. You'd have got nothing. <laughs> We continued to question Delman, but he refused to give us any further information. 11.46 p.m., Frank and I left the Hattrick Hotel and we drove up into the Hollywood Hills. We turned off Laurel Canyon onto Walker Drive. The street was only five blocks long and there were approximately 20 houses on it. 12.22 a.m., we pulled up at the corner of Walker and Laurel where we'd be able to notice anybody who turned into or out of the drive. 1.06 a.m., a man approached a Chevy convertible parked across the street from us. We knew he'd walked down from one of the houses on Walker, but we hadn't been able to determine which one. He passed under a street lamp, and we recognized him as Sam Free, a known narcotics user and suspected peddler. Hold it, Sam. Huh? Right where you are. Hold it up. Oh, sure. Sure. Turn around, Sam. Put your hands against the side of the car. Yeah. He's clean. You guys know me. I don't carry nothing. Mm-hmm. Hey, hey, what you doing in my pockets? I ain't got no gun. You said so yourself. Where the heck did that come from? Why don't you tell us? There's the stuff jar. This all you got, Sam? Well, is it? Yeah. You're coming up in the world, aren't you? What do you mean? A couple of months ago, all we had you paid for was a user and a small-time pusher. It's a lot of H. Where'd you get it? Oh, now, you know better than that. You're in trouble, Sam. Okay, you, you found the stuff on me. That, that means I'm going to do some time. A lot of time. Well, whatever it is, I'd just as soon be in one piece when I come out. Who's the car belong to, Sam? What car? This one right here. Huh? You were getting into it, Sam. Was it? I'll give it a check. Okay. All right, all right. It's my car, so what? I'll still check it. Who, who fed you? What? To where I was. You're not hard to find, Sam. Yeah? You, you've been looking for me over three weeks now. And so? Only you, you didn't know I was the guy you were after. Thank you. For what? For telling us when the H got into town. A lot of good it'll do. Mm-hmm. Now, the day I'd have been clean, you wouldn't have found none of it. No? Yeah. My own fault trying to get a good price. I should have taken what was offered. It's the real stuff, though. A man don't like to give it away. Mm-hmm. Joe. Got something? Yeah. Take a look in the back seat. A bunch of sweaters. Look like cashmere's. I bought them for my girl. It's her birthday. It must be some girl. Yeah. 
At least 40 sweaters there, Joe. Well, they're all different sizes. We took the suspect, Sam Free, down to the main jail and we had him booked on possession of narcotics and suspicion of burglary. An examination of the labels in the sweaters indicated that they were all from the same white side lady sports shop in North Hollywood. 1.58 a.m., we contacted the owner of the store, Mr. T.P. Whiteside. Yes, sir, that's right. Mm-hmm. If you would, we'd appreciate it. Well, about 30 minutes? All right, sir, fine. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, he says they're stolen, all right. Well, why didn't he report it? Well, he didn't know anything about it until now. Well? Huh? It just must have happened tonight. Two twenty-two a.m., Frank and I met Mr. Whiteside at his sportswear shop on Lancashire Boulevard. At the rear of the building, we found a cut screen and a window that had been forced open. We called the crime lab and asked them to check the premises for any physical evidence. Mr. Whiteside made a quick survey of his stock, and as far as he could tell, the only missing item was a supply of cashmere sweaters. Oh, oh. <laughs> I just can't get over it. How's that, Mr. Whiteside? You fellas finding out about all this even before I did. No. Well, I've done my share of complaining about policemen. In the past, that is. Yes, sir. Whenever I got a ticket, you know, I, I used to say to myself, ain't he got nothing more important to do than pull me over for going a couple of miles too fast? That's what I said. Yes, sir. I figured that's all you police fellows cared about, you know, giving folks tickets. Never seemed like you was paying no attention to the real crooks around town. Mm -hmm. Guess I owe you the apology. It's all right. Forget it. No, no, no. Oh, no. I ain't going to forget it. I've been wrong about cops all these years, and you sure showed me tonight. Mm -hmm. Apology, that's what I owe. You going to accept it? Yes, sir. Shake? You bet. <laughs> You too, mister? Huh? You willing to shake with me? Oh, sure. You bet. Here. Say, uh, uh, about them sweaters you found. Yes, sir. Like you to keep a couple of them for your wives or girlfriends. No, sir, that's all right. Thanks anyway, Mr. Whiteside. Ah, uh, you're entitled. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be getting them back. It's our job. Oh, go on. Keep a couple anyway, no, won't sir, you? No, I'm sorry. Please. We can't do oh, that. Oh, well, I, I would offer the reward if I'd known about the burglary. Yes, sir, we understand. Well, it's your own fault. Nobody else is you to blame for it. How's that? No reward. Oh. Huh? Didn't give me time enough. Four oh five AM. The crew from the crime lab reported that there was no physical evidence at the store. Frank and I went off duty. The next afternoon, May 24th, at 4.16 p.m., we checked our weapons at the booking counter of the city jail and we asked to interview the prisoner, Sam Free. The booking sergeant told us he was in cell 104. Yeah? Free in 104. Okay. Free in 104 for interview. Free for interview. Mm -hmm. Sit down, Sam. Sure. You ready to do some talking? About what? The stuff. Where'd you get it? Now look, we had a check by the lab, Sam. Yeah? It isn't Mexican. It's from back east someplace. No kidding. Okay, I got it from back east. I should have want to louse up your scientific cats by saying different. Is that the way you want it on your report? Huh? Uncooperative? Ain't gonna make no difference what you guys put down. It might, Sam. Uh -uh. Oh, look, you, you want a deal, I'll, I'll talk. Otherwise, forget it. We don't make deals, you know that. Huh? It's up to you. Now, look, this isn't your first fall, Sam. It's gonna go hard with you. Maybe. No maybes. Oh, you never know. I, I'm chinning with some of the boys back there. They tell me things have changed around here. Yeah. Case against me might not stand up. You wouldn't want to bet on that, would you, Sam? Hmm. 
Just telling you what I heard. Don't you count on it. Yeah? Things haven't changed that much. Four thirty one PM. Frank and I went over to the Hall of Justice to file a complaint against Free. We talked to Deputy District Attorney Don Avery in the complaint department and gave him a complete statement of facts concerning Free's arrest. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Everything that happened? Yeah. Why? What's the matter, Don? Hmm? Something wrong with this case? I don't know yet. Well, Free himself said it might not stand up. We figured he was just talking. Yeah. We got the H, the stolen sweaters. What more do you need? Let me ask you a couple of questions. Sure. And give me the same answers you'd give in court if you were under oath. All right. Free was beside this car when you stopped him, is that right? That's right. Did you place him under arrest before you searched it? Well, did you? Well, not in so many words. What do you mean? Well, we knew he was a hype. He knew we were cops. He could have figured that out. But you didn't say you're under arrest in those words. No, I don't think I did. Smith? Well, Don, we didn't have anything to arrest him for, not until after we found the age. Mm -hmm. Did you have any reason to suspect he was carrying dope? Well, like I said, he's a user. Yeah. That he was in the neighborhood. We knew somebody around there was carrying. Well, then you weren't looking for free in particular. Well, no. The way I get it, the burglary hadn't been reported yet, is that right? That's right. So finding the sweaters was a surprise. Yeah, it sure was. Well... Yeah. We'll file on them. It may not stick. What are you talking about, Don? The evidence. Well, what's wrong with it? The way you got it. What? You heard about the exclusionary ruling, didn't you? Yeah. yeah Skipper had an assembly on it. Well? Look, Don, we're not lawyers. We're cops. Sure. Well, here's the way it operates. Evidence obtained by illegal search or seizure can be thrown out of court. Simple as that. Yeah? Federal government has the same ruling. Most of the states don't. We never have until now. Before, if a policeman committed an illegal search or seizure, he could be prosecuted. Lots of times he was. Uh -huh. But the evidence could still be used at the suspect's trial. Yeah. Doesn't work that way anymore. No? Well, look, maybe I'm just thick, Don, but it seems to me the only guy who's better off is the criminal. That's how I see it, too. Mm -hmm. Well, all right, now look. Suppose we do pick up a guy. Maybe we aren't right, but we think we're on to something. If he's clean, he's not out anything except a little time and trouble. Yeah. And if he isn't, we got some evidence. Not anymore, you haven't. This just don't make sense to me. Well, what are we supposed to do from here on in? You want to make a search, you've got to get the guy's permission. Or put him under arrest first, or have a valid search warrant. Otherwise, it's illegal. Your evidence may not hold. Let me have that again. If you want to make a search, you've got to get the guy's permission, or put him under arrest first, or have a valid search warrant. Otherwise, it's illegal. Well, now let's take free, for instance. Yeah. We didn't have anything to arrest him on. As for getting his permission to search, well, I got a big picture of that. Mm -hmm. There was no way of getting a search warrant drawn, Don. We didn't even know what we were looking for. Well, that's the way it's got to be from here on in. Every time? Well, there might be some exceptions. I don't know. It's up to the courts to decide. Well, what if we're after somebody, a guy who's heavy? Yeah. Let's take a killer, maybe, so we want to break in. We supposed to ask him if it's all right if we break in? You can get a warrant. Yeah, well, maybe we don't know who he is. Maybe it's 4 o'clock in the morning. What do you do then? When it comes up, you'll get an answer. Well, let's come up right now. What? We got a dope pusher here. He's been selling H to kids. We got him made, dead to rights. Burglary, too. Now, you say he's going to get off. I didn't say for sure. Well, I don't even like to hear a maybe. Not in a case like this. It's the best I can do, Joe. I didn't hand down the ruling. If you'd arrested him first, that'd be different. Yeah, and if he hadn't been carrying, he could have slapped a suit on us for false arrest. The only thing I can tell you, get a warrant, get permission, or arrest him first. Yeah, well, there's only one thing I'm going to tell you. It's not going to work. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. Well, just what do we do? Go back to pound beats? Is that it? Look... I said we might not be able to make it hold up in Free's case. If we can't, you'll get him sooner or later. You've got him pegged. Next time, get to him so it'll stick. Well, don't worry about it. We will. Well? Tell me one thing, Don, before we do. Yeah? How much more stuff is this guy going to peddle? The story you've just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On May 30th, a preliminary hearing was held in Division 4 Municipal Court in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that hearing.
In the case of Sam Arthur Free, the court ruled that the evidence against him had been obtained by illegal search and seizure. The charges against the suspect were dismissed. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Jack Crucian, Herb Ellis, Vic Rodman. Script by Frank Burt. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Most of you are Gunsmoke radio fans, and many of you have written asking to put Gunsmoke on television, too. Here's the good news. Gunsmoke is going on TV starting Saturday night, September 10th. If you enjoy Gunsmoke on radio... We're sure you'll go for Gunsmoke on TV. Now television will have an authentic adult western. The Gunsmoke you know on radio. Remember, Saturday night, September 10th, Gunsmoke on TV. Check your local listings for time and station. This is the NBC Radio Network. Welcome back. It's interesting uh, always to see this sort of hierarchy of morality that you'd have in these uh, criminal circles, uh, where the informant ultimately is like, I might have been a drug dealer, but I never dealt to kids. So, those little uh, shades, and I think he was obviously a struggling person, but I I think actually just kind of interesting to feature with a a lot of uh, shades and variations to him. Now, of course, the whole point of the episode is the titular big ruling. This is very different from a lot of the episodes dealing with this type of point. Because there were episodes of both Dragnet and Adam-12 in the 1960s that showed some of the challenges that uh, police officers faced and the rules and occasionally just loopholes through which uh, criminals might be able to escape justice. However, those tended to be a bit more measured. This seems to reflect a lot of the frustration that many police officers uh, may have felt when this uh, ruling came out and when they began seeing this exclusionary rule applied in their state. And so is less rational and detached than a lot of Dragnet episodes about this topic. Having that sort of quick reaction is probably not the best way to go. And, and I think that uh, Dragnet's later approach uh, made more sense overall, because this may be just the immediate shocked reaction, but the fact is that this is the reality that uh, Friday and Smith need to uh, exist and operate under, whether they like it or not. And I think that when you get into the 1960s and 70s, the view uh, of uh, Dragnet and Adam-12 uh, became more along the lines that uh, this was what you had to do. It was your job to protect the public. Within the bounds of the law, within the bounds of the court rulings that had come down, uh, you've got to deal with what the politicians and the judges throw at you. And certainly there would be you know, episodes where the uh, law and the rulings were explained, and there's an unstated question to the audience at home 
do you guys really think this is how it should go down? But still, it's the understanding that until uh, the law is changed, you have to operate under the limits of what you have in order to effectively perform. Uh, it calls to mind one of my favorite episodes of Adam-12, actually. It's the episode called The Dinosaur. And it was about a police officer who had been wounded in the line of duty and put on disability. And he had spent eight years on disability, but it finally uh, got his badge back and got back on the force. And he was partnered up with uh, Reed and Malloy. Uh, but he was still operated. He, his mind was still um, in that whole mind frame of what the law had been eight years ago and how he had uh, done his job eight years ago. And as a result of him uh, of him not uh, adjusting, uh, criminals actually uh, got let go who uh, w- should have been uh, incarcerated had he kept up. And, you know, uh, Martin Milnor played uh, Officer uh, Malloy was, of course, very sympathetic and respected who he was and his reputation, but he came to a point where he said, you've got to adjust, you've got to roll with your with the punches. And things have changed. And if you hadn't been disabled, maybe you would have been able to adapt and to uh, to to grow in the position uh, so that you could still do the job. But you're not; it's just not working anymore. And you should really step away. Uh, and I think that that approach made more sense. And that's where Dragnet got to. But at this point in uh, 1955, uh, you just get an episode that reflects the average cop's anxiety and frustration rather than how they're going to move ahead. All right, well, I do want to let you know that we are actually getting to the end of Dragnet. We only have two more episodes left after this week. Uh, And in three weeks, we're actually going to bring you a previously uncirculated episode of a series we played some years ago. And then coming in four weeks, we're going to get into Treasury Agent. And this will be the first of many uh, new series that you're going to hear uh, in the time where we're taking a break to Dragnet, and we'll come back to it in a few years. Well, I do want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Peter, Patreon supporter since January, currently supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Again, thank you so much for your support, Peter. And that will do it for today. Join us back here on Monday for Box 13, and we'll be back next Saturday with another episode of Dragnet. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.